Against the background of the full-scale invasion of the Russian Federation into Ukraine, on June 18, 2022, the Lithuanian government banned the transit of goods subject to EU sanctions by rail to the Kaliningrad region of Russia. On 21 June, a ban on transit by motor vehicle was added to this. This decision of Lithuania caused an extremely stormy reaction in Moscow. Including informative excursions into the past. As you know, the main historian of Russia is Vladimir Putin, and in any dictatorship, the entourage of the fewer always tries to be like him. They all want to be like the Fuhrer, Sterlitz thought. Exactly like the Fuhrer. So now another history specialist has emerged from the curb, Dmitro Rogozin, general director of Roscosmos and part-time founder of the fascist party Regina. This is what he wrote on the 27th of June in his telegram, I quote. The Kaliningrad region, just like all the Baltic lands, is the territory of the historical coexistence of Russians with the Baltic tribes and Russia's opposition to the Catholic West in the form of various orders of sword-bearers, Teutons, Livonians, as well as Poles and Swedes attached to them. Russians are the indigenous people of all these territories. Kaliningrad belonged to Russia even after the reign of Peter the Great, and not only legally became our sovereign territory after the bloody Great Patriotic War. Ivan the Terrible and the Romanov dynasty were proud of their Prussian roots, descent from the Prussian Slavs, not to be confused with the German-Prussian conquerors, not to mention other princely Russian families. In 1410, in the historic Battle of Grunwald, Zalgiris, the Smolensk regiments fought heroically against the German knights. This is our land. And no revanchist and illiterate bastards have the right to question it. We will defend our native land. Woe and terrible death to those who try to unleash aggression against Russia. That's right, you heard everything right. In the paradigm of thinking of the rashists, invading the sovereign territory of Ukraine means returning their lands, and any, even the least, restrictions regarding Königsberg are an act of aggression against Russia, because this is its original land. Today, in the video, we will find out who owned the territory of the Kaliningrad region for centuries and whether there is a reason to call it originally Russian land. Greetings, my name is Vladlen Muraev, you are on the channel History Without Myths, where we talk about the past of Ukraine and the world without embellishments and falsifications. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you don't miss our new videos. May Ukrainian YouTube flourish. The modern Kaliningrad region is located in East Prussia. As you can easily guess, the name of this region was given by a group of tribes that lived in the Middle Ages, the Prussians. It was one of the Baltic peoples along with the Lithuanians, Zemites, Oxites, Yatvyags, and Lakals. The absolute majority of the scientific community adheres to the version about the Baltic origin of the Prussians. The Slavic theory is considered something of a type of alternative history. Well, of the same type as Etruski, Eto Ruski. Or an old legend that does not have a strong evidence base behind it. From the 10th to the 13th century, the Prussians often fought with the Poles. There were mutually destructive attacks fueled by religious confrontation. The Poles had already adopted Christianity, the Prussians mostly remained pagans. In the year 1230, Pope Gregory IX granted the Teutonic Order the right to baptize the Prussians and conquer their territories with formal submission to the Holy See. The Teutons carried out a series of campaigns and by the end of the 13th century had conquered the tribes, 20-50% to 50 of the Prussians had died. In the year 1255, on the site of the destroyed Prussian settlement, to Wangst, the Crusaders built a castle, which they called, Königsberg, literally in German, the Royal Mountain. According to the main version, it received this name in honor of the King of Bohemia, Ottokar II, who participated in the campaign. Since then, the number of German colonists in the region steadily increased and the Prussians gradually dissolved into them, becoming victims of assimilation. The Prussian language finally disappeared in the 17th century, when its speakers switched to Low German. 
the rule of the Teutonic Order lasted for almost 200 years. For a long time this state inspired terror on all its neighbors, but in the year 1400 its power was severely undermined by a heavy defeat at Grunwald. As a result, in 1466, the Teutonic Order recognized itself as a vassal of the Polish king. Since then, for two centuries, Poland had a significant influence on Königsberg. Accordingly, in Polish, the city was called Królovec. In the first half and middle of the 16th century, Königsberg Królowiec became one of the centers of Polish printing. Here the first translations of the Gospel and the entire New Testament translated by Stanislaw Merzynowski into Polish were printed. In 1544th year, a university was founded in the city, one of the first in both Poland and Germany. Its great history lasted four centuries until the end of the Second World War. However, formerly Königsberg Króluajek belonged to the German vassals of Poland. In the 16th century, the Teutonic Order was replaced by the Duchy of Prussia, where the Reformation quickly won and Lutheranism became the dominant faith. Catholicism dominated in Poland both now and then. In the middle of the 17th century, Königsberg had an excellent opportunity to get rid of the political influence of Poland. It was then that the coalitions of Sweden, Muscovy, Transylvania, Moldova, and Wallachia arrived in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, and it all started with the uprising of the Zaporizhia army led by Hetman Boden Szmelianicki. Taking advantage of the situation, one of the northern German states, the electorate of Brandenburg, forced the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth to sign the Wieljaw Bydgoszcz Treaty and renounce its rights to Prussia in the fall of 1657. In January 1701, Brandenburg and Prussia united into a new state, the Kingdom of Prussia, and it was in Königsberg that Friedrich Hohenzollern I was crowned its first ruler, although the status of the capital belonged to Berlin. Half a century later, the Russians made their first attempt to conquer Königsberg. This happened during the Seven Years' War. In January 1758, the troops of the Russian Empire captured the city, but it turned out to be only a short episode. Four years later the new emperor, Peter III signed the Peace of St. Petersburg and returned all the conquered lands to Prussia, which probably accelerated the conspiracy against himself and his own death. In the 18th century, the city of Königsberg was glorified by one of the world's greatest philosophers, Immanuel Kant. Here he was born, spent most of his life, taught at the university, wrote his most famous works. Critique of Pure Reason, Critique of Practical Reason, Critique of Judgment Immanuel Kant died and was buried in Königsberg. Fortunately his grave has been preserved to this day, the Putin regime named the Baltic Federal University after him. Although this does not protect against periodic acts of vandalism. In 2018, unknown persons poured paint over Kant's tombstone and monument, and also scattered leaflets with appeals, to give up the enemy name of the German who betrayed the Russian land. But not only Kant. One of the most beautiful and original German writers was born in Königsberg in 1776, Ernst Theodor Wilhelm Amadeus Hoffmann, the author of the works, The Nutcracker and the Mouse King, Little Zaches, The Life Philosophy of the Cat Myrrh, a Gothic novel Elixirs of the Devil and other masterpieces. At the beginning of the 19th century, East Prussia became one of the arenas of the Napoleonic Wars. In 1807, two major battles took place here, in February, near Priusisch Eilau, where Benigsen's Russian army fiercely resisted the French, in one of the counterattacks, the Russian cavalry almost captured Napoleon. As a result, Benigsen had to retreat under the cover of night, which did not prevent the Russians from declaring victory and awarding their officers with gold crosses specially minted for this occasion. And in June 1807, Napoleon managed to win a decisive victory over Benigsen in the Battle of Friedland. The Russians lost up to half of their army and were forced to admit defeat in the war, 
eleven days later two emperors, Napoleon and Alexander met on a raft in the middle of the Neiman River and concluded a peace between them, which had an anti-British orientation. Today, all three settlements are located within the Kaliningrad region and have names from Stalin's times. Priyasish Ilau became Bagrashinovsk. Friedland, Pravdinsky. Tilsit, Sovietsk. So, it was on the territory of the Kaliningrad region that the Russians suffered one of the most crushing defeats in their history. From the year 1871, Königsberg, like all of Prussia, became part of the newly created German Empire. At the very beginning of the First World War, the Russians tried to advance in this region, but were surrounded and defeated, and the commander of the Second Army, General Samsonov, shot himself. By the way, a little-known fact, he was buried in Ukraine in the village of Yakimivka, which is located in the Kropovnich region. After the First World War, under the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, East Prussia was cut off from the main territory of Germany by the so-called Polish Corridor, thanks to which the revived Polish state gained access to the Baltic Sea. When the Nazis came to power, Hitler set himself the goal of eliminating the corridor, which became one of the reasons for his attack on Poland, and thus the beginning of the Second World War. It is worth noting that during the Nazi era, the Gauleiter and Oberpräsident of East Prussia was Eric Koch, also known as the Reichskommissar of occupied Ukraine. It was for crimes in East Prussia after the war that he was sentenced to life imprisonment. The whole region and Königsberg itself suffered greatly at the final stage of the war in Europe. In August of the 44th year, the city was bombarded by British aircraft. However, the greatest destruction was caused by the Soviet assault from the 6th to the 9th of April 45. At the cost of heavy losses, the troops of the 3rd Belarusian Front captured Königsberg, in which about 20% of the buildings survived. According to the decision of the Potsdam Conference in the summer of the same year, the northern part of East Prussia with the city of Königsberg became part of the USSR. Sovietization took place in the first post-war years. Moreover, not only the government changed, the ethnic composition of the population was changed in the most radical way. Of the nearly 400,000 Germans who lived in Königsberg before the war, only 20,000 remained. At first, they tried to turn them into Soviet citizens, but very soon in Moscow they decided to deport all Germans, not only from the city, but also from the region, to East Germany. Mass forced eviction occurred in 1947, the last specialists who helped restore local enterprises were deported in 1949, already to the newly created German Democratic Republic. However, many people did not want to live in a communist country, so they moved to West Germany in every possible way. As a result, a significant number of former residents of Königsberg settled in the land of Schleswig-Holstein, and in their place, in East Prussia, immigrants from various regions of the USSR, mainly Russians, settled. The names of the cities were quickly changed. On the 4th of July 46, Königsberg became Kaliningrad, in honor of the chairman of the Presidium of the Verkhovna Rada, Mihailo Kalinin. He himself never visited the city, and his role in the Stalinist state was mostly decorative. In the same year, Soviet geographers also took up other cities, so Pilau became Baltisk, Nukurin, Pionersk, Insterborg, Chernyakovsk in honor of the commander of the 3rd Belarusian Front, Ivan Chernyakovsky, who came from Umanch, China and died in the battles in northern Poland in February 45. In a few years, there were no local toponyms left in the names of settlements. The Soviet authorities were not too concerned with the preservation of the cultural heritage of East Prussia, the architecture of the region suffered a lot during the Second World War, but many monuments retained their value even in this form, among them the ruins of Königsberg Castle, which many historians and architects proposed to preserve, but they were completely demolished at the end of the 60s. In general, 
the cities of the region have lost a lot of their German flavor, but far from everything. Among the architectural monuments, the Dome Cathedral of the Mother of God and St. Adalbert in Kaliningrad, erected in the 14th century, has been miraculously preserved. Its restoration from the ruins began back in the 70s, but the first attempt was unsuccessful and only after the split of the USSR the cathedral was more or less restored. The newly formed Kaliningrad Oblast became the westernmost region of the USSR, which determined its great strategic importance, which grew stronger with the growth of the Cold War. Militarization of the region took place at an active pace, several large military airfields were built, and Pillau was turned into the largest base of the Baltic fleet. The city became closed, that is, inaccessible to foreign citizens, and it was not easy for Soviet citizens to get there. The headquarters of the Baltic fleet was located in Kaliningrad, and the city also became closed, albeit with a slightly more liberal regime. Among the officers, it was prestigious to serve in the region, many stayed here to live with their families even after retirement. Of course, a large number of active and retired officers influenced the formation of a specific mentality of the residents of the Kaliningrad region. Very similar to the situation in post-war Crimea, primarily in Sevastopol. But, surprisingly, one of the most scandalous stories in the USSR Navy took place in the Kaliningrad region, namely in Baltisk. Mutiny on the large anti-submarine ship Storoshevoy. It seems even more strange that it was headed by the deputy commander of the ship, captain of the third rank, Valery Savlin. But the whole thing is that the uprising was not directed against the Soviet government, but against the departure of the government party from Lenin's principles in the construction of socialism, as Savlin himself claimed. He was supported by a part of the officers and midshipmen of the crew, with their efforts it was possible to isolate the watch commander and capture the ship. It happened on November 8, 1975, that is, during the main Soviet holiday, which gave the event even greater resonance. Sablin wanted to sail a ship to the Nava, stand in Leningrad near the symbol of the October Revolution the cruiser Aurora and make his statement on central television. Of course, nothing came of it, the command conducted a real military operation against the rebellious ship, in particular, it involved bombers, Yak-28 and 216. With the beginning of the participation of aviation, the ship's crew came to their senses, and Sablin, with a shot in the knee, was arrested. The following year, he was shot as a traitor to his homeland. Although the extraordinary prank of Sablin made a noise in the officer environment, no changes took place after this event. Imperial Soviet views continued to dominate and exert a significant influence on public sentiment throughout the Kaliningrad region. But during the times of perestroika, and especially in the stormy 90s, the situation began to change rapidly. The easing of regime restrictions created conditions for establishing business cooperation, primarily with neighboring Lithuania, Poland, and Germany. Tourism began to develop rapidly, former Soviet citizens saw a free world and felt the difference from the one they were used to living in. It is not surprising that Kaliningrad society began to drift towards a pro-Western orientation, Euro-Russians appeared, on whom the communists immediately labeled Kaliningrad separatists. Andrei Vipolzov, editor-in-chief of the NewsBalt portal, was among the opponents of the Euro-Russians. In particular, he said, Euro-Russians consider themselves superior to Russians, think that their mission is to live in Europe, in the European Union and prove that they too can be so civilized, democratic, and free. In the Kaliningrad region, all business, intelligentsia, and practically all young people identify themselves with a quasi-nation, Euro-Russians. We speak Russian, we have ancestors in Great Russia, that's where the identity ends, otherwise, they say, we are Europeans, we live in Europe. Even the governor of Kaliningrad, Mikolit Sukhanov, who was born and raised in the region, was accused of local separatism. In the year 2010, at the beginning of his reign, he visited Poland, 
where he declared that it would be good to rename Kaliningrad back to Konigsberg. Sukhanov then repeatedly made excuses that it was the mass media that misunderstood him, but this did not help much, besides, the economic course of the governor focused on relations with Europe made it possible to doubt his sincere love for Mother Russia. There were many denunciations of a government official, and in 2016, Sukhanov was dismissed from his post, but the Kremlin decided that he had the right to make a mistake, so they kept him in power and sent him to the Ural district as a representative of the President of the Russian Federation. Among the brightest informal leaders of the European integration movement were, Anna Alimpieva, a teacher at the Kant Baltic Federal University located in Kaliningrad, director of the Museum of the History of the City of Savetska, Angelika Shpilayova, writer Boris Bartfeld, chief editor and owner of the newspaper Novie Kalisa, Ihor Rudnikov. As the wave of national chauvinism covered Putin's Russia, the pressure on these people increased. As a result, Alimpieva and Shpilova were fired from their jobs. Novie Kalisa was closed. Rudnikov served two years on trumped-up charges. Putin entrusted the post of governor of the Kaliningrad region to Anton Alikhanov, a 30-year-old native of Abkhazia. What a familiar imperial technique, to pigeonhole a foreigner, brainwash him and send him to a completely unfamiliar region, to create the sovereign's will. Cope, well done, cannot cope, it's not a pity. It seems that Alikhanov has justified himself, he has been in office for six years and in an interview in May he stated that there are no separatist sentiments in the region. On the contrary, we show unity with the country, support for our army and its leadership. Crazy Russian propaganda does terrible things to people, conservative officers exert a significant influence on the mentality, but the latest opinion polls show that the population here is not as united in supporting Putin's regime as Alikhanov thinks. Putin's policy is supported by no more than 64% of the respondents, 54% are concerned about the rise in prices, 52% are worried about the transfer of hostilities to the territory of the Russian Federation. Forty-five percent were worried about the isolation of the region from the metropolis, fears were caused by Lithuania's decision to stop the transit to the Kaliningrad region of goods subject to sanctions. A strong blow from a small country was perceived in Moscow as a military threat. On 21 June, the Secretary of the Security Council, Mykola Patrushev, arrived in Kaliningrad and began to threaten Lithuania with retaliatory measures. However, the famous political figures were the most furious, Tudmitris, Rogozin, and Medvedev. I already quoted Rogozin at the beginning, but Medvedev outshone him. In response to the words of the former Minister of Internal Affairs of Latvia, Maris Gulbis about the first step of the EU and NATO to cut off Kaliningrad on June 27, he said in his telegram as follows. Some fool, a former minister from Latvia, sent a signal that NATO and the EU are taking Kaliningrad from us. He seems to have lost his mind. He proposes to start the Third World War. When he comes to his senses, he will start to be afraid of every sound. That's right, because we remember everything. On the 24th of June, the exercises of the Baltic fleet began, and an amphibious landing was carried out near the Kaliningrad region. Our experience shows that from such exercises to a real war is one step away. Lukashenko also wanted to speak. On June 25 at a meeting with Putin in St. Petersburg, he called Lithuania's actions a de facto declaration of war. On the same day, in the evening, Putin arrived in the Kremlin, one should have expected another mischief from such a sharp maneuver of an old and not very healthy person. The next morning, with reference to Moscow journalists connected to the authorities, information appeared that a meeting was held in the Kremlin at night regarding the war with Lithuania. They even prepared a corresponding statement for the press, but Putin and his associates did not dare to open a second front in Europe, and possibly start a third world war. 
now it is difficult to say what really happened, but the degree of tension in world politics has risen significantly. On June 27, NATO Secretary General Jen Stoltenberg, who is not prone to harsh statements, made a decisive statement. I am convinced that President Putin understands our guarantees of collective security, understands the consequences of an attack on a NATO ally, it will provoke a response from the entire alliance. Stoltenberg also emphasized that Lithuania is only implementing the economic sanctions of the European Union, and they are important so that Putin pays a high price for the barbaric attack on Ukraine. It seems very likely that the EU, NATO, and even Moscow are aware of the dire consequences of a possible escalation. Diplomats are clearly working hard. Already on June 29, the Reuters agency reported that the European Commission was considering the possibility of excluding the Kaliningrad region from the sanctions regime, which provides for restrictions on transit through Lithuania. And on June 30, Der Spiegel reported that the German government was outraged by Lithuania's actions and feared that the German soldiers in Lithuania may be involved in a conflict with the Russian Federation. Friends, in your opinion, which state should Kaliningrad or Kenningsburg belong to? Write about it in a comment. Don't forget to subscribe to History Without Myths, like and share this issue on social networks. Thank you for viewing. Glory to Ukraine.